I'm going to grab this water here because I'm going to need it, but um, I promise to give a, a little a bit of a, a brief intro. I don't want to spend too much time on that because there's far more subjects uh, to cover today, um, but I am the uh, curator of natural history um, here at the, uh, the Willis McDonald Fourth Curator of Natural History at the Draper Natural History Museum. We have really long titles here, part of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Um, on any given day, uh, we spend our time um, in the exhibits. We spend our time uh, giving educational outreach and programming, kind of like we're doing today. Um, but we also are working with our natural history collections, uh, as well as conducting research. That can be research with our collections or research in the field. Um, this photo here is from our uh, second year of the Absorca Bat Census Program. Um, if you caught the presentation in 2022, um, I gave an overview of the first year of research in that we have one more year of field work for that program this year, um, and that will complete that three-year project and a variety of uh, manuscripts um, will, will come out of that as well as additional presentations. So stay tuned for that probably in 2025 um, or so is, is when we're going to be really be digging into those data. Um, but today we're going to take a little bit of a hybrid approach and we're going to talk about a fascinating relationship between a bird and a tree. Um, but before we dive into that, I would be remiss to not acknowledge the incredible staff that I work with. Everything that we do um, is not because it's a one individual driving a ship. It's, it's a whole team um, and I get to work with some of the best folks here. Uh, so I'm really, um, really grateful uh, for this, this crew and uh, they've helped support me um, as much as I've helped support any of them. Um, so now let's get into a couple quick mildly boring but also entertaining definitions. Um, ecology can be thought of as a way of studying um, and understanding nature. Uh, so when we think of ecology broadly, uh, we probably start off by default thinking at the ecosystem level. And that is the study of the relationships among organisms um, and the biotic and abiotic components of their environment. So biotic, you think of the root of that uh, life. So that is the living components of that ecosystem. The abiotic components, those are the non-living things, things like rocks, water, snowpack, et cetera. So how do those organisms interact with those uh, components? Um, and as you can kind of sense, there's something happening visually here. If we remove those abiotic components and we just deal with the biotic components of the ecosystem, we're really looking at community ecology. So that's the interaction of different species um, within a given area. Uh, one step removed from that, if we just look at the interactions of conspecifics or members of the same species, then we're looking really at population ecology. And we can deduce that even more simply um, at the organismal level, which is looking at those specific adaptations of um, how a species uh, is able to survive within its um, environment. But in reality, um, organisms and the environment in which they reside in are frequently inseparable and forever intertwined. Thus, the study of one area really is um, overlapping with um, many of the others. So, hence the, the figure for the, the sagebrush uh, community. So, what's in a name? Uh, let's begin with who will be the avian focus of today's ecological foray. Um, the pinion jay is about a robin-sized bird um, it's a songbird, so they have a variety of calls and vocalizations um, with a rather descriptive common and scientific name. Um, the name, Gymnorhinus cynocephalus, uh, is ancient Greek um, roots, and it literally translates to the bare-nostrilled, blue-headed bird. Um, you know, ornithologists uh, and people that classify birds in particular uh, weren't overly creative with the names. Um, we can think about this as the rough-legged hawk, the red-shouldered hawk, the red-winged blackbird. Um, they tend to be very descriptive. So when we look at this bird, you know, you'll see there's no feathers around the nostrils, hence the bare nostrils, and well, it's blue head. It's really blue-bodied. It's blue all around. Um, but this is the name we got, and this is the one we're sticking with. Um, so the pinion jay is no exception to that rule of creativity when it comes to naming. Um, if we go a little bit further, it's a member of the corvid family, uh, which consists of over 130, uh, more than 130 species. This includes your common raven, your crows, your magpies, all the ones that we commonly see around here. 
And then birds that are found in other parts of the world, uh, rooks, uh, jackdaws, tree pies, um, and then you think of the Clark's nutcracker, that's also a member of the corvid family and closely related to uh, the pinion jay, or related to the pinion jay, I should say. Um, but the pinion jay is very unique uh, in this group. In fact, um, it's the sole representative of its genus. So while you have all these other corvids that we commonly think of, the one that stands alone, special all by itself, is the pinion jay. Um, and indeed, these birds really are fascinating. That's why, I, you know, why am I going to spend the next better part of an hour talking about them? Um, it's hopefully to get you as excited about them as I am, because they're, they're pretty incredible organisms. Um, they are indeed uh, birds of a feather that do flock together. They forage in flocks. They range widely. Um, they can be in a group of a dozen or so, or they can be in groups of hundreds to a thousand, um, depending on the region. Most of the research that we um, know, most of what we know based on the research of these guys uh, has been conducted in the southwestern part of their range, um, Arizona and New Mexico, Utah and Nevada. Um, there's not a whole lot, we'll get to see how far they range here in a bit, but there's not a whole lot of information or data outside of that relatively confined geographic area. Um, although essentially the entire global population of pinion jays reside in in North America. Um, they have very complex social and kin structure uh, with a wide variety of calls and vocalizations, everything from warning calls to, to greeting calls to they can identify individuals based on calls so they know whether or not um, as they're all flocking together um, in return from foraging and everyone's calling out feed me, feed me, they know which calls are of their own uh, immediate kin. Um, and one quick quote from a very, very incredible uh, book that I highly recommend if you get as obsessed with this as, as, uh, as you may. Um, there is a wonderful book uh, called The Pinion Jay, which is a solid 300 pages of, of goodness, um, all, all, on, all on this bird. I highly recommend a lot of the information that's presented in today's lecture has come from this book um, and other sources, but the foundational information on pinion jays has come from there. And one quote I do want to point out from that is that Pinion jays have the most complex kin structure known for group living birds. The kin structure of their large flocks is more reminiscent of baboons than birds. And it's just pretty incredible to think about that. I mean, how, how did this complexity evolve in this species? Um, it has been called the blue crow, though the official common name for this bird is the pinion jay. And it's aptly named for its close association with, and one might even go as far as to suggest dependency on the pinion pine tree. However, we don't have pinion pines in northern Wyoming, yet we do have the pinion jay here. So what are they subsisting on? What are they living on? If there are no pinion pines, what are they eating? Well, in lieu of the pinion pine, another close relative, the limber pine, is known to be widely distributed um, in northwest Wyoming. We look at these range maps, if we go back one, we see uh, the, the green here um, are the pinion pines, and that distribution ends right at the bottom border, southern border of Wyoming. And then in the purple here, that's juniper. So we have plenty of juniper woodlands here, um, but you know, we're missing that pine. So we go back over to the limber pine, we see that's much more of a, a dominant pine species here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And comparable to the pinion jay, the common and scientific names uh, give us an indication of some of the unique properties of limber pine. True to its name, the branches of limber pine are incredibly flexible, so much so that they can even be tied into knots. And while you are welcome to try this, the one request is, while this is really cool, please do not leave these branches in knots because leaving no trace in nature is even cooler. So let's get back to why the pinion jay. What's so interesting about the pinion jay and again, why am I spending so much time on this? We know that from data collected by the Breeding Bird Survey that pinion jays have experienced substantial declines over the past 50 years. Furthermore, the decline is higher in Wyoming than any other state in which data has been collected for the species. Wyoming represents the northern range of its distribution, yet no formal study has been published documenting their uh, occupancy 
um, the size of these populations and so forth in the region. So we really, it's a black hole of data. We really have no idea what is happening here in, um, in Pinion Jay land in, in the northern end of its, its distribution. Um, the data for this figure comes from the Breeding Bird Survey, which is a cooperative effort to monitor the status and trends of North American bird populations. And it's collected, remarkably collected, by thousands of dedicated citizen scientists. So several of you, perhaps many of you even in this room, have collected data that have contributed to these trends. And these are data for populations and trends of over, I believe it's over 400 species of birds. Um, that we're able to, to, to see what is happening over time based on observation records. So if you've not done this before, um, if you're curious about it, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's something that's done every year, um, and it's a wonderful community of people, and it's all real data that scientists, ecologists, wildlife managers alike are all using to drive management direction, decisions, um, and action. So it's a way to get involved as a citizen scientist, and if you are so intrigued, um, there's uh, going to be a way for you to be involved in this study as well. So back to limber pine. Um, it's a sensitive species of interest, and it's threatened by a number of factors. Research in the Absorca Mountains by Cleaver et al. in 2015 documented high mortality in 75% of the plots containing limber pine that they monitored. Mortality was due to a combination of mountain pine beetle and white pine blister rust. Additional research um, ex expects that limber pine, it will, uh, sorry, it's a bit, bit tricky for me to explain this, um, that the basal area of limber pine uh, will experience a 40% reduction um, in less than 15 years. So with regards to basal area, the way we can think about this is if you look at the figure here um, from Gilbert um, and you just focus on that top row, uh, the first two um, uh, circles there, uh, six inches here in the upper left and 10 inches, this would be a 40% reduction. Um, so that's looking at the amount of surface area and the number of trees, so it's density, it's volume, um, and surface area that is required uh, to equal the same density, volume, and surface area of trees found in ones with a larger diameter. So to s experience that 40% uh, decline in basal area means we'd be looking at much uh, thinner diameter trees um, to, to produce that same volume. Um, so in, in these figures, one thing I'm remiss to mention is that the, the, the black dots are, are representing individual trees within a given uh, spatial uh, constraint, given area. Um, furthermore, Schottel predicts that about two-thirds, oh, I jumped ahead here. Schottel predicts uh, about two-thirds of mature limber pine in Canada will die off in the next 100 years. If that wasn't enough, 73% of stands in northern Colorado, Wyoming, and southeastern Montana have been invaded by white pine blister rust. So this species, in concert with the pinion jay, are experiencing a, a wide-ranging and high number of threats um, that can have serious implications for the management of these species. So let's stick with trees here for a minute. We've introduced the corvid. We've introduced the conifer of this story. Um, so let's take a little bit of a deeper uh, dive into both. Both the pinion pine and the limber pine have evolved large wingless seeds. So seeds come in a wide range of uh, shapes and sizes um, and dispersal mechanisms. Um, pine seeds do this. Uh, there's a wide range of, of different pine seeds, but so do seeds of other trees and plants. Um, most seeds are dispersed by agents, abiotic factors, wind, water, or gravity. And this makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, these abiotic forces are ever-present on the landscape, um, and the energy investment uh, required or relating to seed design requires no additional effort from the plant to aid in dispersal. However, on the, uh, or on the negative side of that, um, the downside to relying on these mechanisms is that seeds dispersed through wind, water, or gravity um, means that those seeds often end up falling in close proximity to the parent plant or tree and often in inhospitable environments that do not facilitate or enable that seed to germinate. So how and why would limber and pinion pine evolve large and wingless seeds? Um, if they cannot be dispersed by, by wind, water, or gravity, that means there needs to be another factor, another agent in there. 
um, and that can have an energetic cost. Well, to understand that, we're going to need to go back in time a little bit and, and take a field trip way, way back, um, gain a bird's eye view of the situation. So ancestral pine, that is the predecessor to both pinyon and limber pine, belonged to a community of plants uh, known as the major tertiary flora, which occupied the region uh, that we now know as, uh, or occupied the region that was once known as the Mexican Plateau. Uh, this community was known to contain several drought resistant species of plants. About 60 million years ago, the climate of North America shifted from being relatively mild and moist to being much warmer and much more arid, much more drier. Drought tolerant plants were able to withstand this climate shift um, and even flourished with these changes. So through the Miocene and the Pliocene eras, expansion continued. D uh, distribution expanded and contracted in response to glacial activity in the Pleistocene, resulting in the distributional pattern that we see today. And observed in the, the fossil record, pines were quick to spread up and down in elevation across very wide distances and in all directions, omnidirectional. Um, so this could not be random. Um, it could not be attributed to wind, water, or gravity dispersal mechanisms. So something else was at play. If we revisit those agents and we talk again, we learned before pinion and limber pine have these large wingless seeds and they evolved in a relatively warm and arid environment. When we think of extreme harsh uh, environments such as a desert, again, we're going on a far extreme here, having energy reserves is essential. So small seeds may not have been able to withstand those extreme conditions of a very harsh environment. Those seeds may not have been able to germinate under those conditions. And without adequate water, nutrients, or reserves, environmental factors may have driven those plants to produce these larger seeds. Larger seeds solve the immediate need to survive in a harsher climate by facilitating the plant's ability uh, to colonize these new environments. They enable, um, they have the reserves to enable a faster root growth. That root growth allows them to retain more water. That water ensures survivability in times of scarcity. Um, it gives them an advantage in root growth and the ability to trap and retain that moisture. So over time, large seeded plants may have outcompeted small seeded plants under these climate conditions. Now again, we were not present at this time, so this is our, our best understanding of how these mechanisms may have evolved. There are possibly other explanations for that, but this is one logical path of thought that could have led us to today and also led us to explain the observations that we're seeing in the fossil record as well as in the distributional patterns of today. So big seeds equal big dilemmas. Recall the harsh nutrient limited environment that we mentioned before using our desert as an example. Um, large seeds require significant amounts of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And if we look at pinion seed and limber uh, pine or pinion and limber pine seed composition, they're both very high in uh, pinion pines, very high in carbohydrates, um, limber pine, very, very high in fat. So these are very nutrient rich, nutrient dense, um, caloric intensive uh, treats for, for animals. Um, plants must either then create a few precious seeds at a time or store up reserves long enough to produce many seeds all at once. So a big seed, high nutrients, lots of calories, well, that's also a big incentive for seed predators. It's a big reward for them to find seeds, um, especially if they are easily detected and highly desirable. And so that's gonna facilitate a concentrated harvest effort of those, those seed predators. But small consistently or predictably produced crops, i.e. given you know, a plant that produces a small amount of crops annually, um, would be targeted and decimated by seed predators. So we need a solution here. Um, we've evolved this large wingless seed to facilitate germination in a difficult environment, but now everybody wants to eat our crop. How do we survive this? Um, the solution here is to have synchronicity among members of that population um, to produce them at an irregular interval and at an unpredictable time. So this is where we get the term bumper crop. 
We have years where we're really not seeing much activity. We're really not seeing much growth, um, no seed production. And then other years, it's spiking in the chart. Um, the strategy there is that you need to overwhelm seed predators. You need to overwhelm consumers and ensure that there are leftover seeds for survival, for germination, to pass on those genetics to the next uh, generation. In order for this strategy to work, all trees, and this is what's mind-blowing to me, all trees in the population must be on the same yearly cycle. So how do these trees synchronize when to produce a crop with no uh, perceptible means of communication? It's, it's baffling. But then if we think about those factors of natural selection, we think about the factors of, of evolution, um, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Because those trees that fall out of sync with their conspecifics will have a disproportionate amount of predation pressure placed upon them, which is likely going to result in having fewer and fewer of their seeds uh, survive any predation event. Um, predation would have thus driven the natural selection of trees within a population to force them in sync with one another. That alone is, is just absolutely incredible to me. Um, so yeah, let that sink in for a moment because, wow. <laughs> All right, back to, back to the hero of this story. Um, Corvids are incredibly curious. Um, we'll get to that here in a second, but initially the bird we now know as the pinion jay likely began as a generalist, probably made, ate a wide variety of different uh, things, um, insects, seeds, uh, fruit, um, you name it. Um, it's probably how they survived initially before the evolution of, of this large um, winged seed. And, and to be truthful, I don't know at this moment whether or not uh, the J pre-existed the, the pine or the large wingless seed, and I'll have to look into that. Um, so what this means is this bird likely began to take advantage of those bumper crop years when, when they were available. And being a corvid, they're naturally curious in investigative or inquisitive organisms. Um, they will explore many aspects of their ecosystems, um, especially the nuances, and particularly when something new enters the ecosystem. Um, so they'll inspect it visually, they'll inspect it physically, and manipulate things with their bills. Um, so once it satisfied its hunger by consuming as many seeds as it could, it probably began to do what most of us do um, at a young age, and it probably began to play with its food, probably began to pick up those seeds, move them around, um, throw them up in the air, and poke them in the ground. Um, and, you know, it's, it's human nature, but it's also just nature. So when we go one step further, here's where it gets really interesting. Most captive corvids, this is true uh, across the wide um, a majority of, of this uh, group of organisms are known to conceal objects within their confinements. Um, faced uh, with a surplus of food, um, early jays may have taken up this uh, behavior with pine seeds. Um, just ask Melissa and Brandon with our raptor experience program and our common raven Becky, one of the early things she did when she got into her new space was to hide things so that her uh, caretakers could not find them. Of course, you know, the one piece of paper she hid it under we had a pretty good idea where it was, but in her mind, it was hidden. Um, so if we think about this from an evolutionary perspective, we think about this from a survival strategy, and now we're starting to really get somewhere. Um, in times of food shortages, caching seeds would have, had been, would have been highly advantageous, um, and even more so if the birds developed the spatial memory and capacity to cache and recover those seeds. That caching behavior would have been highly advantageous for survival, um, particularly if they're caring for young or caring for um, a partner, a mate. So what's in it for the pines? It's a pretty good deal for the jay. Um, and bumper crops, you know, an abundance of food, a, a gluttony fast hate, you know, it's a beautiful thing. But what does the tree get out of this? So the rapid and the omnidirectional expansion of ancestral pines in the fossil record suggests that dispersal was aided by some other agent other than wind, water, or gravity. Thus, to the best of our understanding, all evidence and speculation suggests that in exchange for ample food rewards, the J would have facilitated dispersal of these pines. 
But that also begs the question, well, why wouldn't the J have just consumed all of the food? Um, you know, when it's there, we don't know when the next meal is going to be, so why wouldn't it have just continued to consume? Well, just as the tree, its survival strategy is to overwhelm seed predators and produce more seeds than could possibly consumed, it's the same, uh, same is true for the J, that the J is going to cache more seeds than it can possibly retrieve or consume. Um, and just how many seeds are we talking about, and why can't the J recover them? Well, I keep saying here's where it gets really interesting, but this is why this story is so amazing, is that pinion jays have uh, developed an elastic esophagus capable of expanding, say this three times fast, to a volume of 17 milliliters or the equivalent of about 40 pinion seeds. So they can load up their esophagus with you know, several dozen seeds, fly around as happy, as content as can be, and then go deposit them, go feed them, et cetera. So when you're talking bumper crops and seeds everywhere, you know, this is just an overwhelming abundance. Um, and they're just going everywhere with a, a, a gullet full of seeds. And recall the scientific name here, um, baronostral blue-headed bird. The baronostral adaptations prevent sap from the pines from clinging to the feathers that would otherwise cover the nostrils. Um, and it covers and does cover the nostrils of nearly all other corvid species. But perhaps more impressive is the fact that these jays will catch literally thousands of seeds per year. Um, that, that crop is available, I should specify. Uh, it's difficult to cache something that is not there. So when the seeds are there, they will cache thousands of them. Um, and their ability to recall these caches is uncanny and shared by a relative of theirs, the Clark's Nutcracker. In Clark's Nutcrackers, they are said to have something called hippocampus elasticity or hippocampus plasticity. Uh, your hippocampus is the portion of the brain that is responsible for memory retention and recall. Um, if we take the other word, the plasticity, elasticity, that's something that can expand. So in times where it is called upon, um, if they have the capacity to increase the retention of memory and to recall those locations um, using this adaptation, think about that in concert with the ability to carry more seeds, food, to store them, to recall where they are at a later point in time. All that in concert working in survival is just this really amazing story of uh, co-evolutionary arms race among these organisms. Um, so in short, during the caching season, the hippocampus swells, um, and that allows those organisms to remember the precise location of each of their caches for a certain amount of time, um, and it varies, but say around three months or so, and then the ability to recall those cache locations starts to drop off and decline. So what happens to the seeds that are not recovered by the J? Well, those, if they're planted in a hospitable environment, they have the capacity to potentially germinate and thus passing on the genes of the parent tree. So as you can imagine, um, the benefit to this in times of food scarcity or with a uh, irregular and unpredictable food source, um, it plays a major benefit to, to this organism specializing in that food source. These unique adaptations between the corvid and the conifer have resulted in a codependent relationship that has worked incredibly well for both species for a very long time. Now, let's go back to the uh, why am I talking about this and the bigger picture here. Um, pine juniper encroachment into sagebrush habitat has more implications, uh, has implications for more than just these species. Um, it also impacts the greater sage grouse. So coming back here, we've seen a nearly 85% decline in pinion jays in the past 50 years. Um, again, this is based off the breeding bird survey data. The remaining population of pinion jays is expected to decline by an additional 50 amount within the next 20 years. When we think about how do we manage for uh, threatened and endangered species? Oftentimes, you protect the environment, the habitat in which that organism lives, you protect that organism. Um, you protect its food source, et cetera. So when it comes to greater sage grouse, which is another species of conservation interest, oftentimes management implications are mechanical thinning of vegetation or prescribed burning, and that 
thinning and burning tends to occur in pine juniper woodlands that are encroaching into sagebrush. And so now we have a dilemma. We have the pinyon jay that's been petitioned in 2022 to be listed as a species, an endangered species. Um, we also have another species of conservation concern that while not listed is receiving active conservation um, uh, management um, efforts but there's a potential overlap between those species. So when state and federal um, management agencies are tasked with dealing with this, you know, how do you know what to do if we've not studied one side of the story? Uh, could habitat implications for one have a detriment to the other? Um, furthermore, a lot of this area is uh, potentially viable um, to be scoped for energy development. And so when we, look at, when we look at this big picture, we're trying to figure out how, how do we make the most sense of it and where can we help and, and what kind of information can we provide. Starting with what we know, we know we don't have pinion pines, okay? We do have substantial uh, populations of limber pine. Limber pine stands are affected by white pine blister rust here and mountain pine beetle. Um, and we also know that we have resident populations of pinion jays in Park County and likely throughout the Bighorn Basin, though they have never been studied, surveyed, or monitored. We furthermore know that pinion jays are relatively non-migratory and they have high site fidelity. So if we think of that, that just means sticking relatively close to the area in which uh, they, they were raised. However, what we don't know is that how many pinion jays do we have in the region? Um, here in northern Wyoming, how many distinct populations of pinion jays are found here? Um, where do they nest? How large are their colonies? How far do they move between nesting colony and foraging grounds? What role, if any, does disease like West Nile virus, influenza, or malaria play in the decline of jays? And likewise, what role is white pine blister rust and mountain pine beetle playing in our region? And furthermore, are pinion jays in Wyoming morphologically distinct from other populations? And are they genetically distinct? So any organism, any population, think of my fists here as populations, okay? Same species, um, two populations. Any population that is separated from another po population by a large geographic barrier, uh, we can say, just for sake of argument, a really large mountain range, really big river, really wide desert ecosystem. If these populations are physically separated for long enough, and we're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, they can become genetically isolated. And that as mutations are constantly occurring, they can become fixed in populations. And that's how we have the divergence of species from one to two, is it begins at the molecular level. So we don't know if this region has been isolated long enough to warrant that there is a genetically distinct population. Are they morphologically distinct because they're feeding on limber pine here as opposed to um, pinion pine? Are those cone structures different enough to warrant morphological adaptations in these species? So here, that's some of what we're hoping to find out. And also, we have no idea if we're even gonna catch these guys. They're really smart, and you know, we're gonna see what we can do here. But um, we have a pretty decent team. So we put together this project, this proposal. Um, I won't read this whole title, uh, but uh, our goal is to look holistically here at focusing on pinion jay and limber pine, um, but using the pinion jay as the umbrella here. Um, can we look at this interaction among pinion jays, limber pine, and greater sage grouse. Um, there's a, a great team we're working with here with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, Northwest College, um, a Museum of Wildlife and Fish Biology in Davis, California, um, and then, of course, uh, the Draper Natural History Museum here. And this, uh, this project is going to launch this spring, um, March, uh, the end of March, I believe. And, um, you know, for the first year, we're just really hoping can we get out and survey potential habitat sites uh, that pinion jays are likely to be occupying? If we can, can we locate them? We would like to trap and ban them, tag them uh, with um, uh, loggers, data loggers, as well as GPS tags that will tell us where they're going, when they're moving, how long they're spending time there, et cetera. 
um, find out where they're nesting, how large their nesting colonies are. There's a whole lot we're hoping to get covered. We'll see, we'll see how much we can do. With every jay that we sample, we will sample a morpho a morphometric measurements as well as blood samples. Um, and the hope is down the line, perhaps use that blood to look at the genetic side of things. Um, that would also going to require with some of these tags that we're going to re need to recapture these birds. And some birds can get really, really savvy to, to trap design. Um, other birds can just be really happy that they're going to get a food reward knowing that they're just going to get released. So we'll see. Um, but we'll need to analyze that movement data uh, to really see uh, what is happening. And then use those data to inform uh, survey and capture efforts in year two with the goal of identifying these, these nesting colonies, colony size, um, and foraging grounds. So, you know, with that, there's, there's a lot of folks I want to thank for this project. Um, this is really to set the foreground of why we're undertaking this study, why this fascinating relationship exists, and how there is still so much information missing. Um, and again, I, I encourage you, if you're interested, to definitely check out the book, The Pinion Jay. Um, can't recommend it enough. There's a lot of great, great content in there. But then also, if you'd like to be involved in one capacity or another um, with this project, we do need your help. We need to know where these birds are because we can't be everywhere all at once. And as you can imagine, uh, one of the challenges with doing any kind of research here um, is you have limitations of resources. And that's people, uh, time, um, and financials, right? So we are looking at this as uh, with any research project that the Draper Natural History Museum gets involved in, how can what we provide, how can what we do help the efforts of our state and wildlife, uh, state and federal wildlife managers? Because um, oftentimes we are all looking at this, this system together and there's a lot of ground to cover. So this is a, this is a really exciting project for us um, and it also has the potential to benefit uh, multiple species here that these folks are, are tasked with managing. So we want to know, do you have these birds at your bird feeders? If so, we have these data sheets that we would love for you to uh, give a try, beta test for us, see if they work, where we can improve. Um, we'd love to know how large these flocks are, how frequently they visit, how long they spend at your feeders, all sorts of little details like that. Um, if you're interested, you can come talk to me, you can come talk to Amy, you can email Amy at Amy P at centerofthewest.org. We would love to get you some uh, data sheets and see, um, see what we can find out about our local pinion jays here and with the hopes of getting our hands on a few, getting some transmitters on them and seeing what they tell us. So with that said, I'm happy to take any questions um, you may have and thank you for your time. I'll leave this up here. Like, isn't this bird really cool? It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. What was the last part? Cedar berries. Oh, juniper berries. Gotcha. So the first question is, where will these um, birds cache their seeds? Will they always cache them in the ground, or will they use um, a variety of other uh, different substrates? And yeah, they, they will use many different things. So um, it, they also learn over time. So a young jay may put it in the, the nook of a tree, um, but any other predator, seed predator that's flying overhead may see that seed and pick it off. So it would behoove that organism to to find a more discreet place and rely on its memory um, to recall uh, where, where it placed it. But they do use a variety of places. Sometimes it'll be just under something, sometimes it'll be in a ground, um, and yeah, it varies. And then the second question is, um, do they exclusively eat uh, you know, the seeds of that pine or would they eat juniper berries? And yeah, they, they definitely will. And um, there's a one photo, if I can find it real quick, uh, that does show that um, they have a juniper berry in the mouth, let's see we can find that. Um, while I'm looking for that though, another question, feel free. What's the end, re uh, end result you're looking for from all this data gathering? There we go, there's our juniper. What's the end result that we're looking for for data gathering? Um, initially, uh, it's very difficult to determine decline of something if you don't have a baseline of data. 
right? So in the first couple years, it would be wonderful to know how large of a population are we dealing with here? Because we can't say, oh yeah, we're, we're really, the, we're seeing growth in a population. We're seeing that our management efforts are working if we can't say the population increase at all because we don't know where it started. Or on the consequent side of that, if it decreased, you know, if we don't know where we're at, what's ground zero right now? That's, that's our goal. How big is this colony? How big are the nesting colonies? Um, and is this, uh, are they, what are they threatened by most? Because we need to identify that in order to make any significant um, improvement in their condition. So you have that chart showing the decline of the species. Is that a, a national mm -hmm. survey of them or more localized? Yeah, national. So the, that's the beauty of the breeding bird survey. The way it works is it's the same day. Um, and uh, everyone goes out together, uh, the, the, you have groups and um, defined areas, okay, this group is going to go here, and this, is, this occurs all over uh, North America, so Canada and the U.S. Um, very, very wide citizen science driven effort. And actually, if you remember, uh, Sue here mentioned in December um, an effort to, uh, to be a part of that. So next year, be on the lookout here, we'll, we'll give that pitch again um, to join. Um, but it, it's a very concerted effort. Um, uh, oh, there's an, that's all coinciding together. Yeah, it was another C word I'm looking for, but I can't find it. Um, that they are tracking this on the same day every year. So it's a trend. It's like this year and now for you know these five years, we saw a consistent number that was pretty high. And then over time, that's when they're starting to see like less and less. We're observing this bird less and yes, less and less over time. Um, and that's nationally. That and or or plus Canada, um, but these birds more so. Here. But yeah, the breeding bird survey is is um, a very wide uh, concentrated effort. So are you referring to the Christmas bird count? Yeah, that's yeah the breeding bird survey, Christmas bird count. So, sorry, yes, the Christmas bird count, the breeding bird survey are, are one and the same. I'm curious about the mechanics of feeding. Oh yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> that's a, a, an excellent question and i don't know off the top of my head do they swallow it whole do they chew it up um i think we need to we need to find out um i can say though the reason they found out about the um expandable esophagus is through a, a, a museum collections um they cannot uh it, it would be a, a bit cruel to use a live bird um and so they pinched one end of the esophagus and they filled it up with water um, and that's how they got the volume of to see how large can it expand. Um, as for their consumptive uh, practices, that I don't know, but it would be really cool to, to witness and watch. Yeah, Jern. Great question. So as colony nesters, do they assist one another or are they independent? And that's what's really wild about these birds and their really complex uh, kin structure is that they do have um, what's called helpers and there's some some mixed um, uh, research about whether or not it benefits a jay to be a, a helper which is a non-breeder but is helping feed other jays um, but as they forage and they're bringing seeds back to the nesting colony um, they will feed their young but they will also feed the young of others um, so it's a really interesting and, and at that they are non-territorial um, flocks are non-territorial, um, and so they can forage together. Um, and the, uh, yeah, I did, I, there's so much I didn't go into. That's really cool. Let me let me back up even more. When they identify a food source, there's usually a couple of um, let's call them uh, uh, like pilots, and they'll they'll go and they'll say, hey, there, there's a lot of food here, and they'll alert all the others, and then everyone comes and they feed together. Um, and there's a couple that sit on lookout as sentinels. Um, to look for predators and uh, any other dangers while everyone else is feeding. And then they switch, the sentinels go in, they, they feed, and others go up and look. And then they all leave together. So they try not to leave each other behind, whether or not they're um, uh, immediate, uh, direct, directly related or not. Um, and then they'll go back and they'll feed the back at the, whoever's back at the nesting colony. 
Um, so that's really, it's a really fascinating uh, social structure, social system. Right. So are there two genders or sexes? Um, to my knowledge, yes, but there are some species of birds like cardinals that you have gynandromorphs where uh, y they <laughs> are literally half male, half female in the same bird, and that's pretty wild. So look up that one, gynandromorph. That's pretty crazy. Um, and then the helpers tend to be uh, non-breeding males. Um, so that's, that's what we've seen, at least in, in the literature from um, Marzoff and um, Ambalda. And there was another question. Yes. That's a great question. So what about white bark pine and um, whether or not they, they would utilize that food source and as white bark pine range contracts or expands, does that see a relationship with bird movement um, relative to site fidelity? Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I wonder myself whether or not there is competition among nutcrackers and pinion jays. Um, nutcrackers uh, will subsist um, primarily on white bark pine, but they also do make use of limber pine. Um, and we're looking right now, like that's that's the interesting thing is like nutcrackers tend to be a higher elevation species, whereas we'll see the pinion jay here in the basin um, and then creeping up into that mountain forest a bit. Um, what does that overlap zone look like? That I'm not sure. We do know that nutcrackers have been responsible for moving the tree line of white bark pine. Um, by where they cache those seeds, um, so similar behavior of, of caching, um, and that has affected the, uh, the movement of the white bark pine. And, and also, interestingly, uh, we've found um, that some of the stands of white bark pine will be genetically influenced by which uh, groups of nutcrackers are caching those seeds. So if they are disproportionately caching seeds from one stand of white bark pine, those genes are passed on more because they're the seeds getting cached and planted, whereas others may not. Um, so that relationship does exist. But as for pinion jay impact and influence to white bark pine, that I'm not sure. No, not too much. They're relatively non-migratory, um, and that's that's what makes it a, a little bit easier of a, a species to to try and study. Um, they may move, uh, but we really don't know how much, um, and I really say that's going to vary uh, per study area. So you think about why, why would an animal migrate, number one. Um, it's going in search of better habitat, food, possibly mates, right, um, re reproductive uh, of benefit. Um, but if that food exists, if their uh, reproductive potential exists all in that same area, the, and the uh, adaptation or the ability to survive in a changing climate exists, or seasonally, I should say, weather seasonally, um, then there's less of a drive or a need for that organism to migrate long distances. It's also going to be a function of the density of food that's available, right? Um, you're going to travel shorter distances, you know, if we have five grocery stores within a mile. If, you know, we need to go to Costco for things, then we got to go a long ways, right? And it, it's, it's a comparable uh, scenario where if that food density is there, they're going to move uh, shorter distances. If it's more sparse or scarce, they're going to travel further distances in search of food. Um, so as long as the food is there uh, and the reproductive potential is there and the habitat is there to survive, then um, the need to migrate is lessened, migrate long distances. Yes? What are their favorite nesting areas and what can people do to um, enhance or encourage, uh, encourage us? Um, tree cover, uh, they, they do nest in pine juniper trees um, here that we see. 
Uh, you'll usually see, I want to say, maybe one to three nests per tree in a nesting colony, but that can vary, again, depending on density and availability. So cover um, from predators, uh, nest predators. Ravens are um, a, a, a difficult predator. Oftentimes what, they, uh, what uh, these researchers in, in this book have found that if they go to study nests and they go to look at nest contents, they have to be very cautious of any other corvid, particularly ravens and crows that are in the vicinity because they'll watch people, they'll watch movements, and if they see somebody visit a tree over and over, then they know, hey, there's something in that tree, I'll check it out. And they will go and consume eggs, they will go um, and uh, kill young. Um, yeah, ravens are, are metal. Um, what can people do? Uh, there are, they, they love sunflower seeds. Um, if you are consistently uh, putting out, oh, man, the, the plosives. Um, if you are consistently putting out bird seed, um, they do like uh, they do like sunflower seeds. Um, we are in a bit of a um, challenging environment in, from the sense that while it's great to encourage um, uh, you know bird feeding and backyard uh, bird feeders for these birds, we're in grizzly bear country. So the best times to do that if you were so inclined would be really during the winter when bears would be hibernating that would be the safest time and also the time at which food is probably the most scarce so that would have the maximum benefit for these birds would be when you're trying not to overlap between when it could be a food attractant for another predator that is looking for an easy meal um, that we would like to avoid conflict with with one that um, could use a, a boost um, so yeah, they, they visit backyard bird feeders uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, there's a, I know that there's anecdotally that there's um, pinion jays out on the South Fork. fork. Um, there's pinion jays out in Clark region, um, but is it the same group? Uh, are they traveling that far for food sources? I'm not sure yet. So that's part of wanting to know, but yeah, trying to not overlap your, your feeding um, uh, with a, uh, with the grizzly bears would be would be the key. Yeah. You talked about data collection mm -hmm. and then a twenty twenty five analysis stage one. Stage one. Well how's yeah. that gonna be coordinated and what is your role gonna be? Yeah. Right, right. Um so that's uh that's the beauty of science. Science is collaborative. It's seldom when you um, look at like a, um, a research paper, it's gonna have a whole bunch of names on it, should have a bunch of names on it. Um, and that's because many different people are playing different roles. Um, and so a lot of the disease analysis is gonna be uh, Eric's focus, um, Eric Atkinson, because that's part of his expertise. Um, some of the movement data, a couple of us are probably gonna be involved with that. Um, and we may need to even enlist other folks. There's a, a, a wonderful group called the Pinion Jay Working Group, um, just as there is the Wyoming Golden Eagle Working Group and the Bat Working Group and, and all these working groups. Basically, is a, uh, just a term for a bunch of folks that um, belong to a different entity, um, and they are working together to solve common problems. So we may approach them to say, you all have analyzed a lot of movement data with GPS tags and, and XYZ what is a good approach to address this and how can we what questions can we ask about our data you know we have all this movement data how can we pick out different parts of it to ask and answer questions that shed different light on the movement patterns and behaviors of these organisms so it's seldom done in a silo i guess is the way i'm going to say it. um there's going to be a lot of discussion back and forth and initially it might just be as simple as okay we see every day at you know sunrise uh, 6 45 a.m. these birds are going to this location which is a limber pine stand and they're foraging first thing in the morning and every day they're returning back to their nesting colony by like 1 p.m. that alone is just going to be if we plot out those data we'll be able to see okay these are the foraging behaviors so if we want to trap them and we are, we didn't have great success with physically trapping birds the first year but we did get movement data then we might say we need to be at these sites at 6 a.m. trap set ready to go and that might encourage uh, that might increase success the following year so it's going to be a bit of a trial and error process um, and I have a note to check my phone for an online question here and that is is there a color difference between males and females no so they are not sexually dimorphic 
Um, some species are uh, sexually dimorphic, um, where the typically in birds the male is more brightly colored than the the female. Um, in pinion jays, that is not the case. Um, so they can tell the difference, um, but we really can't easily. Um, and they also birds have internal sex organs or gonads, so you know it's not as easy as seeing. Um, you know, the difference between a bull and a cow. Are there gray squirrel middens? Do they raid squirrel middens? It's a great question. I don't know. And squirrels might, if a squirrel is observing, they might raid pinion jay caches. I do know that there's something called the pinion mouse that was, um, that organism showed up in one of the slides that has an incredible, incredible sense of smell. They would raid pinion jay caches. Um, and it also raises the question if survival of that seed is important for the tree and this mouse has evolved a specialized sense of smell that allows them to seek out these seeds, it would benefit the tree to hide that scent from the seed. So if it hasn't, does that mean the tree requires that chemical to produce the seed and it cannot synthesize it in an odorless form. We don't know. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I want to know. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll hang around if you have any additional questions. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. What about suet? Yeah, they, they will, if you go on eBird, um, and I encourage everyone to do this, uh, and sign up. Go sign up on eBird um, after this. Uh, make an account so you can document your observations and then send them to me too. Um, and uh, you'll see, if you look at the photos, you'll see them um, going all over suet. Yeah, all about it. Yeah, yeah so they are, even though the, the, the pinion jay eats, you know, the pine seeds, it will eat a, a wide variety of other other things so chances are if you're putting food out your bird feeders consistency is the key for them they need to cue in on it first they need to find it and then <laughs> and then you might regret it because <laughs> they might all descend upon uh, your feeders but um but it'd be a it'd be a fun experience so thank you appreciate you stay tuned for march um, when julia cook will give our next uh, featured presentation thank you all